We start the program by the recitation of Holy Quran by Hafiz Najib Matu Bahman, a young Hafiz, inshallah, he recite the Holy Quran. طعام حكيم كالمهل يغلي في البطون كغلي الحميم خذوه فاعتنوه إلى سواء الجحيم ثم صبوا فوق رأسه من عذاب الحميم ذق إنك أنت العزيز الكريم إن هذا ما كنتم به تمترون إن المتقين في مقام أمين في جنات وعيون يلبسون من سندس واستبرق متقابلين كذلك وزوجناهم بحور عين يدعون فيها بكل فاكهة آمنين لا يذوقون فيها الموت إلا الموتة الأولى ووقاهم عذاب الجحيم فضلا من ربك ذلك هو الفوز العظيم فإنما يسرناه بلسانك لعلهم يتذكرون فارتقب إنهم مرتقبون صدق الله العظيم We, we know, I think, uh, Dr. Zakir Naik does not need any introduction now because most of us already know him. But for the benefit of those who have uh, come to this evening, this lecture, first time, I give a brief introduction. Dr. Zakir Abdul Karim Nayak is a medical doctor. Uh, he is uh, uh, coming from Bombay. He is the son of a prominent uh, social worker and a medical doctor, Dr. Abdul Karim Nayak. He is uh, a dai in his own uh, way. He is inspired by uh, Chef Dida. And Alhamdulillah, the work of Dawa he has taken a great distance has expanded and has given a new direction to that. Uh, today, his cassettes, his uh, lectures, not only give information but inspiration to all of us and especially to our young children who have seen, uh, after seeing his lectures, they not only learn about Islam but uh, they are uh, getting reassured and uh, in turn starting to talk about Islam. So I think that is the greatest achievement uh, by the lectures of Dr. Zakir Nai and most of it, all of us, we need uh, the uh, way he is presenting Islam and the information which is inspiring to all of us. So, without uh, taking much of your time, uh, today's uh, topic is Dawa or Destruction. Dawa or Destruction. So, I request Dr. Zakir to come and start his talk. Thank you very much. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم كنتم خير أمة أخرجت للناس تأمرون بالمعروف وتنهون عن المنكر وتؤمنون بالله بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل إن كان آباؤكم وأبناؤكم وإخوانكم وأزواجكم وشيرتكم وأموال اخترفتموها وتجارة تخشون فسادها ومساكن ترضونها أحب إليكم من الله ورسوله وجهاد في سبيله فتربصوا حتى يأتي الله بأمره والله لا يهد القوم الفاسقين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم 
رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل اقدة من لساني يفك وقولي الله يكم اولو فيو with Islamic greetings السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته may peace, blessings and mercy upon my chair Allah be on all of you it's a pleasure to be back once again in Jeddah amongst the people of Jeddah the topic of this evening's talk is Dawa or destruction what is the meaning of the word Dawa I'm sure most of us may be, me, may be knowing the word, the meaning of the word Dawat. The moment you hear the word Dawat, immediately you start thinking of a lunch party or a dinner party. <coughs> Dawat does not mean a lunch party or a dinner party. It means an invitation. Today, we will not be talking about an invitation to a lunch party or a dinner party, but we will be talking about Dawat al-Islam, the invitation to Islam, to the Deen al-Haq, the religion of truth. An invitation can only be given to an outsider. Therefore, the moment you speak to a person who is not within the fold of Islam and you talk about Islam to him, it's called as Dawat al-Islam. So Dawa can only be done to a non-Muslim. I start my talk by quoting a verse of the Holy Quran from Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 110, which says, Kuntum khaira ummatin ukhridat linnas. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that O oh, ye Muslims, ye are the best of people evolved for mankind. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving us Muslim an honor. He's calling us Kuntum Khaira Ummatin. O ye are the best of people evolved for mankind. Whenever there is an honor, it is always followed up with a responsibility. For example, in a school, the principal has got more honor than the vice principal. The vice principal has got more honor than the teacher. And the teacher has got more honor than the clerk. But along with the honor, it is always followed up with a responsibility. In the same way, the principal has got more responsibility than the vice principal. The vice principal has got more responsibility than the teacher and the teacher has got more responsibility than the clerk. So when Allah says in the Holy Quran, Kuntum khaira ummatin ukhridat linnas that O oh, ye are the best of people, he was for mankind. When Allah is giving us such an honor, do you think it is followed up with a responsibility? The responsibility is said in the same verse. It says, Ta'miruna bil ma'arufi wa tanhawna an munkar that we enjoy what is good and we forbid and we forbid what is wrong. But Billah and we believe in Allah. Allah calls us Kuntum Khaira Ummatin, the best of people, because we enjoy what is good and we forbid what is wrong. If we don't enjoy what is good and we don't forbid what is wrong, then we are not Kuntum Khaira Ummatin. We are not fit to be called Muslims. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us the honor because it's a compulsory duty for every Muslim to enjoy what is good and to forbid what is wrong. The moment we see a person doing evil, we should ask him to stop it and enjoin the people towards the good. But unfortunately, we Muslims, we are not doing our duty. If we do not do the hour, if we do not enjoy what is good and what is wrong, we are fit to be called Puntum Khaira Ummati. And the Holy Quran mentions in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 143, that we have made you a community justly balanced. 
the middle most community, Ummah the Wasp, so that you may be a witness over the nation, and the messenger will be a witness over you. It is the duty of every Muslim, the whole Ummah, to be a witness over the other people, over the other nations, and the beloved Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, will be a witness over us. The other verse of the Holy Quran, I quoted in the beginning of my talk, was from Surah Tawbah, chapter number 9. Surah Tawbah happens to be the most militant surah of the Holy Quran. Why do I say that Surah Tawbah is the most militant surah of the Holy Quran? Because it is the only surah in the whole Quran which does not start with the beautiful formula Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim in the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful. Otherwise, each and every chapter besides Surah Tawbah, all the other 130 chapters of the Holy Quran start with the beautiful formula Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim in the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful. For example, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Qul a'udhu bi rabbil nas Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Qul a'udhu bi rabbil falaq Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Qul huwa Allahu ahad Every surah starts with a beautiful formula Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim In the name of Allah Most gracious, most merciful But Surah Tawbah does not start with this beautiful formula Why? <coughs> because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala If you read the first few verses Verse number 1 to 4 there is a treaty between the Muslims and the pagans of Makkah, a peace treaty. And this peace treaty was unilaterally broken by the mushriks of Makkah, by the pagans of Makkah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them a warning in verse number 4 and verse number 5. He says that if you do not put things back within four months, then there will be a declaration of war. If you do not put things back in four months, there is a declaration of war. And Allah says in verse number five that after the four forbidden months are over, wherever you find these mushrik, wherever you find this pagan, slay them in every stratagem of war. But if they ask for forgiveness, you may let them go. But Allah is giving a warning. Whenever any warning is given, but natural, you have to be firm, you have to be militant. For example, if you are walking with your wife on the road, but I am walking with my wife or my sister on the road, and suppose there is a hooligan who snatches the handbag of your sister or of your wife and he runs away. But natural, you will chase the hooligan. And the moment you catch him, you will not say, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim In the name of Allah most gracious, most merciful You will not say Assalamu alaikum May peace be on you You will say Hey mister Give the handbag or break your arm Hey mister Give the handbag or break your neck You have to be firm You have to be militant In the same way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala When he gives a warning To the mushriks of Makkah Bismillah is uncalled for Therefore I say That Surah Tawbah is the most militant surah of the Holy Quran. But by the time Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, by the time he reaches verse number 23 and 24, we Muslims, we are in the firing line. We Muslims, we are in the firing line. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is addressing us Muslim in Surah Tawbah chapter number 9 verse number 24 by saying, Kul in kana abaukum. Say whether it be for your father, wa abnaukum or your sons, wa iswanakum or your brothers, wa azwajukum or your spouses, your wives or your husbands, wa ashiratukum or your relatives. And I say, what are your considerations? Your fathers, your sons, your brothers, your spouses, your relatives, what are your considerations? Otherwise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Holy Quran, in Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 20 and 24, that 
ask to worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the next duty is to be kind to your parents. And Allah says that I have ordained to you that you worship none but Allah and that you be kind to your parents. But at the same time Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says in Surah Nisa chapter number 4, verse number 134, that Ya ayyuhal ladina amin, O you who believe, stand out firmly for justice and witness towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even if you have to go against yourself against your parents against your kids and kin or for the rich or poor for Allah protects both before justice you even have to go against yourself or your parents otherwise you have to always respect and love your parents so Allah says in Surah Tawbah chapter number 9 verse number 24 what are your considerations your fathers your sons your brothers, your wife, your relatives, what are your consideration? And Allah continues. The wealth that you have amassed, the business in which you deal, the dwellings in which you delight, the house in which you live. Allah says, what are your consideration? The business? Some people may say, no. If I do dawa, then, then the non-Muslim customers will not come to my business. They will not come to my shop. What I consider is the wealth that you have amassed, the house in which you live. Allah says in Surah Baqarah chapter number 2 verse number 261 that if you sow one grain in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah will give you seven years, each year bearing hundred corns, hundred grains. That means if you sow one grain or one corn in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah will give you 700 grains or 700 corns. Imagine, 700 times profit. If you calculate in business terminology, it is 70,000 percent profit. I want to know which business, in which business will you get 70,000 percent profit? Allah promises you and Allah continues and says, I will give you many fold more. So if you put your wealth in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah promises you no less than 700 times, 70,000 percent profit. So Allah asks you what are your consideration? Your father, your sons, your brothers, your wives, your relatives, your wealth, your business, the houses in which you live, and Allah continues. Ahabba ilaykum min Allahi wa rasulihi wa jihadin fi sabilihi. If you love all these things more than Allah, His Rasul, and doing jihad in the way of Allah. Allah says, for the Rabbasu, you wait. Allah is asking us Muslims to wait. And believe me, we are waiting, sitting on our backside doing nothing. What does Allah mean when He says, for the Rabbasu? What does Allah mean in the Holy Quran when He says, wait? What does He mean? For example, if suppose a teacher says in the classroom that look out for a word in a book, when, a, when the students are reading in a book and when the teacher says look out for a word, the teacher actually means you should look in the book, not look out of the book. It exactly means the opposite. That's the genius of the language. When the teacher says look out for the word, she actually means you have to look in the book, not look out of the book. Similarly, suppose there is a senior student in the school who is bullying a junior student and when the senior student is bullying the junior student, the junior student says that you wait till I get my elder brother and his elder brother happens to be the biggest hooligan of that area. When the child is telling the senior student that you wait, till I get my elder brother, he is not actually asking him to wait. He is telling him, you scoot off, you buzz off, otherwise you will be taught a lesson. You don't do it. Similarly, when Allah says in the Holy Quran, Fatarabbasu, it does not mean wait. It means you better wake up. Fatarabbasu, hatta yaati Allahi bi amri, wallahu la yahadu kumul fasiki. Wait until Allah brings about his decision unto you. 
until Allah brings about His destruction unto you. Wallahu la yalikum al-fasikim. And Allah guides them the poverty transgression. So Allah is asking the Muslims that you better improve, that you better wake up, otherwise destruction will come upon you. And Allah guides not the poverty transgressors. Allah tells us in the Holy Quran, in Surah Muhammad, chapter number 47, verse number 38, He says, وَإِنْتَ تَوَلَّوْا يَسْتَبْدِلْ قَوْمًا غَيْرَكُمْ ثُمَّا نَائِكُنْ أَمْسَالَكُمْ That if you turn away from your path, if you do not do your job, يَسْتَبْدِلْ قَوْمًا غَيْرَكُمْ Allah will substitute in your place another people. Summa laikunam salakum. And they will not be like you. So Allah is telling that if you do not do your job, if you turn away from the past, Allah will substitute in your place another people. Summa laikunam salakum. And they will not be like you. And history testifies this. That Allah has his way. That whenever he substitutes a people, he always chooses the people who are looked down upon. Those people who are looked down upon, Allah brings them from the dust and makes them to sit on our head. For example, if you see history, the Jews, the Jews looked down upon the Arabs. They said, these Arabs, they are barbaric people. And when Allah says in the Holy Quran in Surah Juma chapter number 62, verse number 5, that the similitude of the Jews who were asked to deliver the Mosaic law, who were asked to deliver the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and they did not do the job, is same as a donkey who is carrying tons of books, but he understands it not. The, the Jews were asked to deliver the message, but they said, what is the use of delivering the message to these people, the Arabs? And at that time, it was the Yomil Jahiliya. The Arabs, it was called the days of ignorance. No one even wanted to rule the Arabs. They were so ignorant that they did the tawaf from the Kaaba absolutely naked. They had a beautiful logic. They said that how can we present ourselves better than the way we came in this world? Therefore, they did the tawaf from the Kaaba absolutely naked. Even the conquerors, they did not want to rule them. They were not fit to be ruled. The Arabs they were looked down upon. So Allah, through His Holy Quran, through His revelation, these ignorant people, He makes them the torchbearer. He makes them to sit on the heads of the Jews. Allah has His way. The Jews don't do the job. Allah says, Ya stabdil qawman gairakum. Allah will substitute in your place another people. Summa laikunam salakum. And they will not be like you. But unfortunately, if you see the history, the Arabs, the Muslims, we ruled Spain for about 800 years. But we did not do the job. We did not do Dawah. Later on, the Crusaders came and we were wiped out. There was not even a single man who could openly give the Azan, imagine. And today, the only thing we can see in Spain besides the bullfighting and the castanets, is the beautiful building and the monuments made by our forefathers. But we don't do the job, so Allah substitutes the people. Allah has His ways. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says in the Holy Quran, He gives us guidance. We Muslims, we say, that we love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala more than anyone else in the world. We love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala more than our mother. We love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala more than our father, our sister, our brother, our wife. We say, Alhamdulillah, we say. But do we actually mean it? <coughs> Verbally we say, we love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala more than anyone in the world. But actually, do we mean it? I want to ask a question, let's suppose your neighbor, if he abuses your wife or if he abuses your sister and if you come to know about it, what will you do? You will surely hammer your neighbor or you put him in his place. 
if you yourself are not capable of teaching your neighbor, unless you want to do, you will hire somebody else to put him in his place, won't you? Of course. Why? Because we love our mother, we love our sister. If anyone abuses our sister, if the neighbor abuses our sister or mother, you see to it that you will put the neighbor in his place. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He cries in the Holy Quran. He says in Surah Maryam, chapter number 19, verse number 88 to 92, He says, Wakalu walada. And they say, the Christians, they say, Allah most gracious has begotten a son. Allah is crying in the Holy Quran. Wakalu taqadur rahman walada, lakad jittu mashayan idda. It is indeed the most monstrous thing to say. To say that Allah has begotten a son, it is the most heinous abuse you can give to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wakalu taqadur rahman walada, lakad jittu mashayan idda. Takadu samawati fattana minnu. As though the skies are ready to burst open. What an ashakul arzu and the earth to split asunder. What a khirul jibaru hadda and the mountains to fall down to utter ruin. Allah says that if you say Allah has begotten a son, it is as though the skies will burst open. The earth will split asunder and the mountains will fall down to utter ruin. But to us Muslims, it makes no difference. It makes no difference at all. Our neighbors, our Christian neighbors, our non-Muslim neighbors, our friends, they many a times abuse Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They keep on saying that Allah has begotten a son. But to us Muslim, it makes no difference at all. But we say verbally that we love Allah more than our sister, more than our mother. If it was the fact, when someone abuses our sister and our mother, we want to put the neighbor in his place. Why don't we want to do the same when someone abuses Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Why don't you deliver the message to him? Why don't you clarify the misconception that he has? Our Christian neighbor, our Christian friends, they say, that Allah has begotten a son. And they quote, as which is the keyboard quote in the Bible, they say, it's mentioned in the Gospel of John, chapter number 3, verse number 16, that God soul of the world, that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever shall believe in Him shall not die, but shall have everlasting life. Have we tried to deliver the message to them? Have we tried to correct them? Have we ever, have we made an effort Allah says, it's the biggest abuse you can give to him. And Allah says in the Holy Quran in Surah Baqarah chapter number 2, verse number 120, He says, وَلَن تَرْدَى أَنْكَ الْيَهُودُ وَلَن نَسَارَى حَتَّى تَتَّبِيُوا مِلَّتِيُوا Which means that the Jews and the Christians will never be satisfied until you follow their brand of religion. They will never be satisfied. And Allah says in the Holy Quran, Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 111, وَقَالُوا They say, the Jews and the Christians, وَقَالُوا لَا يَكْرُوا الْجَنَّةَ إِلَّا مَنْ كَانَ هُودًا أَوْ نَسَارًا That you Muslims, you shall never enter Jannah until you become a Jew or a Christian. The Jews and the Christians, they say that you Muslims, with your salah, with the mark on your forehead, with your zakah, with your hajj, with your Ramadan, with your fasting, with all these things, still you shall never enter Jannah until you become a Jew or a Christian. Allah gives the answer. Tilka amaniyu. It is the wishful thinking. Bakwas e bakwas. Kul. Tell them. Hatu kunhanakum. In kuntum sadiki. Produce your proof if you are truthful. You tell them that what you are speaking, if it is the truth, produce your proof. And they have produced their proof, the Bible, in more than 2,000 different languages. They always say that my Bible says this, my Bible says that. My Bible says this, my Bible says that. And they have produced the Bible in more than 2,000 different languages. You name it and it's there. 
in almost all the languages of the world. What do we have to do? Do we have to follow the Bible, hope, line and sinker? When you ask for a proof, what do you do? You examine the proof. You have to verify the identity. We have to read the scriptures. When Allah says you ask them for the proof, Allah does not mean that you should follow the Bible, hook, line and sinker. You have to analyze it. These Christian missionaries, they read our Quran. They read our Holy Quran and they ask us questions. They ask us questions by saying that, do you know it's mentioned in the Holy Quran that Bible is the word of God? And most of the Muslims will say yes. They say, why don't you follow it? They ask you the question that by name, your last and final prophet, Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, is only mentioned five times. By name, is only mentioned five times in your Holy Quran. But Jesus peace be upon him, he is mentioned twenty-five times. So who's greater? They don't give you the answer. They let your mind think. They don't give you the answer. They pose the next question. That your Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. Did he have a mother and father? He said yes. He had a mother and a father. Did Jesus peace be upon him? Did he have a father? He said no. We agree that he was born without any male intervention. He had a mother, Mother Mary. May Allah be pleased with her. But we believe that he had no father. So who's greater? They ask you the question, but they do not give you the answer. They let your mind answer. They tell you that your last prophet, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, did he ever give life to the dead? He might have done other miracles, but did he give life to the dead? You say, yes, we agree, he did several miracles, but we have not heard of any miracle in which he gave life to the dead. Did Jesus, peace be upon him, did he give life to the dead? You say, yes, the Quran mentions that, be wake up in the name of Allah. So who is greater? A person who can give life to the dead or a person who can't give life to the dead? That is the question. They use us as punching bags. They use us as doormats. Allah says in the Holy Quran, in Surah Al Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 64, He says, Kul ya ahl al kitab, say, O people of the book, ta'ala wila kalmitin sawa'im, bainana bainakum that come to common terms as between us and you. Which is the first term? Allah na'abuda illallah that we worship none but Allah. Wala nushika bihi that we associate to partners with Him. Wala yattakhidha ba'zuna ba'zuna arbaban min dunillah that we erect not among ourselves lords and patrons of Allah. Fa'in tawallah if then they turn back. Fa'kulu shadu say we bear witness we are now muslimun that we are muslims bowing our will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This verse of the Holy Quran is a master key for doing da'wah. If it works for the Ahli Kitab, for the Jews and Christians, use it. If it works for the Hindus, use it. If it works for the Parsis, use it. It's a master key. If we work for each and every non-Muslim, it says, that come to common terms as between us and you. The first term is Allah na'muda illallah that we worship none but Allah. Wulanushika bihi that we associate to partners with Him. Have we told our non-Muslim friends that you should worship only one Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Have we told? We go for salah. Alhamdulillah, many of us pray regularly, many pray five times a day, we go to the mosque for salah, we go to the masjid, and there we hear our Imam, many a times reciting in the Surah class, Qul huwa Allah ahad, say he is Allah one and only, Allah hu samad, Allah the absolute eternal, lam yil balam yulat, he begets not nor is begotten, wa lam yakul lahu kufu an ahad, and there is nothing unto him like. 
a imam is reciting in the masjid, in the mosque, say there is Allah one and only. I want to ask the question, does any of other Muslims, do we say that God is more than one? Do we? No. So why is the imam telling us that there is Allah one and only? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling, Qul, say, Qul huwallahu ahad, say he is Allah one and only. Allah is asking you to go and tell those people who do not believe in one Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah is one and only. Allah is Samad, Allah is the absolute, <laughs> the eternal. Lam yalit wa lam yulad. He begets not, nor is begotten. Tell it to those people who say that Allah has begotten a son. Tell them that Allah begets not, nor is he begotten. Wa lam yakul lahu kufu an ahad. And there is nothing like unto him. We read the Salah. Unfortunately, most of us don't understand what the Imam is reading. We, the moment we go out, we forget everything what we have been programmed in our Salah. Allah tells us to say, but we say, why should we say? Why should we interfere with the faith of the other people? People give excuses. They give excuses for not doing dawah. For example, some may say, see, I don't have enough knowledge of Islam, so I am not the right person for doing dawah. See, dawah is the job of a person who has a lot of knowledge, alim, who has ill. I don't have enough knowledge. Therefore, when I gain enough knowledge, inshallah, that time I will do dawah. Our beloved Prophet said, anni wa ayah. That Propagate even if it be one verse. Even if you know one verse about Islam, you have to say it. You have to propagate it. You have to preach it. And I'm sure that every Muslim at least know few points about Islam. They at least know La ilaha illallah. That there is no God but Allah. They at least know that Allah is one. You have to go and tell your non-Muslim friends that say there is Allah one and only. He may ask you for proof that how can you prove the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even if you don't know how to prove logically, at least do the job, at least tell him. If you do not know the answer, what will you do? You come home and do the homework. When in an examination, if I give an examination, if you don't know the answer and if you fail, what do you do? In your next paper, you see to it, the question you are unable to answer, at least that answer you know very well. And you do your homework, you study harder. So you go home and find out how to prove the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You go and tell him that our beloved Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, he was the last and final messenger. They want proof, just do your homework. Proof to Tell them that the Holy Quran is the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If they ask, how can you prove it? If you know, you give the answer. If you don't know, come home and do your homework. Alhamdulillah, now since the media and science and technology have advanced, we don't have to search a lot for these answers. Everything is available on your fingertips. Everything. There are video cassettes by several speakers which are available to us, even in the market. For example, if you want to know how to prove to a non-Muslim about the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, about Quran is the word of God, there are video classes available in which I have given a talk, is the Quran God's word. And there are proof logically that the whole Quran is the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, irrespective of whether he be a Hindu or a Christian or an atheist or a scientist, he will be convinced with the answer. Now you can prove the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The moment you go home and do the homework, you become a master in that answer. So now you can answer to your non-Muslim friend about the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, about how to prove the Holy Quran is the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you tell him, do the right call. He says, what is the proof? Go home and do your homework. Now you are a master in three answers. In this way, you yourself will increase your knowledge. Even if you know one verse, you have to propagate it. 
There is no excuse for anyone for not doing dawah. It's compulsory. So the Muslims will say that see, speaking about Islam to non-Muslims, yes we should do it, but first we should speak to the Muslims. We should make the Muslims better Muslims. We should first make the Musliman Pakka Musliman and then we should do Dawah. I have got no harm. I do agree that we should also do Islam. Islam means improving the Muslims, giving more knowledge about Islam to the Muslims. I do agree we should do Islam also. But if anyone says that first we will make the Musliman Pakka Musliman and then do Dawah, that time will never come. It will never come. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. He could not convert. He could not change his own family members. He could not change his uncle. Do you think you are better than him? He did his job. He delivered the message. The Quran says in Surah Gaisha, chapter number 88, verse number 21. It says, Fazakke inna manta muzakke. Your job is to deliver the message. Changing hearts is in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But your job is to do zakat. <laughs> is to deliver the message. But some people say, no, first we make the Muslim man pakka Muslim man. And then we will speak to the non muslim That time will never come. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, in the farewell pilgrimage, he said that had every one of you, and there were more than 1,10,000 sahabas, more than 110,000 sahabas were present there, he asked them that did you received the message and all of them unanimously said Beshak we did we did receive the message then our beloved prophet said that all those who are present here deliver it to those who are not present here and believe me more than a hundred thousand of the sahabas were buried outside Arabia for what? for making Musliman Pakka Musliman? no for doing dawah to deliver the message to the non-Muslims Our beloved Prophet, he sent messages. He asked the scribes to write down messages about Islam to the non-Muslim kings of Persia, of Byzantine, various kings, many of which also tore off that letter, which contained most of the Holy Quran. Do you think our Prophet was wrong? Because there were many people in Medina who were yet not perfect Muslims. Our beloved Prophet said, that there were many Muslims who did not come for the compulsory congregational prayer. This mentioned Sayyid Bukhari. Many Muslims who did not come for the compulsory congregational prayer, for the Jummah Salah. He said, I feel like burning their houses. That means there were Muslims who were not perfect. But yet, our beloved Prophet said, give the message to the non-Muslims. It has to be simultaneous. Dawah and Islam should be simultaneous. You can't say, I will first make all the Muslims pakka Muslim and then do Dawah. That time will never come. We want to give excuse for not doing Dawah. We say, let see, when our own deeds aren't good, our own deeds, they aren't good, so how can we speak to the non-Muslim? They will point a finger at us. They will tell us, you Muslims, you aren't good. What are you coming and giving us the message? What are you delivering the message to us? You Muslims, you, you, you yourself aren't good. So therefore, first we'll make the Muslims good and then speak to non-Muslims. Believe me, that time will never come. <coughs> I pose the question to such people and I tell them <coughs> that I want to ask the question, are you better or those Christian missionaries who come from Europe and America? They come and they drink alcohol. Do you drink alcohol? They say no. They do identity. Do you do identity? They say no. Who's better? We are better. With all the defects, these Christian missionaries who are wine people, who are alcoholics, who are adulterers, still they are converting hundreds and thousands of people. Why can't you do? They have the falsehood with them, with all the defects, with all the ill habits. Yet they are able to convert thousands of people. What's the problem with you? 
do three years more than them? When they can do the job, why can't you? You know why? Because to speak to a Muslim is very easy. If I tell a Muslim that he offers a salah, even if he does not pray, he will not hit me, he will not slap me, he will not abuse me. Why? Because he is a Muslim. It's easy to tell to a Muslim, Are bhai, die rakho, keep up here. Why? Even if he does not keep, he will not abuse me. Are bhai, go and fast. Why? Even if he does not fast, he will not, he will not repel. But if I tell to a non-Muslim, I am afraid. I am afraid that it may backfire. You want to do the easy job. Therefore it is compulsory for everyone to do both, Dawa and Islam. And believe me, there are some people who quote the Quran to say Dawa is not required. And they say, it is mentioned in the Quran, Lakum dinukum waliyaddeen, that to use your way and to meet mine. Therefore, Quran clearly says, that let them follow their way of life. Why should we interfere? These people, they are misquoting the Quran. They are quoting a verse of the Holy Quran out of context. What they are quoting <coughs> is from Surah Kafirun, chapter number 109, verse number 6. But for the context, you have to refer to all the six verses. We say, قُلْ يَا أَيُّهَا الْقَافِرُونَ لَا أَعْبُدُ مَا تَعْبُدُونَ وَلَا أَنْتُمْ عَابِدُونَ مَا أَعْبُدْ وَلَا أَنَا عَابِدٌ مَا عَبَدْتُمْ وَلَا أَنْتُمْ عَابِدُونَ مَا عَبُدْ لَكُمْ دِينُكُمْ بَلْيَدِينَ Which means that say to those who reject faith, you worship not that which I worship. I will not worship that which you worship. You will not be worshipping that which I want you to worship, nor will I worship that which you worship. To you is your way and to me is mine. First, deliver the message. After he rejects the faith, then tell him that I will not worship that which you worship and you will not worship that I worship. But first, the, the question of rejecting the faith comes only after you deliver the message. It does not come before delivering the message. After you deliver the message and then if he rejects the message, then after trying your level best, then you can tell him to use your way to meet mine. That is not the first resort, that is the last resort. That is the last resort, not the first. Some people say, the Quran says that life of the deen, there is no compulsion religion. So therefore, why should we bother with the non-Muslims? We should not compel them. You know, again they are misquoting the Quran. They are quoting out of context. What they are referring to is the verse from the Holy Quran from Surah Bahra, chapter number 2, verse number 256. And it does say, like Deen, there is no compulsion religion. But read the complete verse. The complete verse says, truth stands out clear from error. If you reject the evil and if you believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you will crack the most trustworthy handhold. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take you from darkness into the light. And if you hold the hand of the Satan, he will take you from light to darkness. Complete the full words. Complete the full context. Don't just say life of din, there is no compulsion religion. Also say truth stands out clear from error. Present the truth. After you present the truth of Islam, you don't have to force him. You don't have to convert anyone at the point of the sword or the point of the can. It, it is forbidden, it is haram to convert anyone at the point of the sword or at the point of the gun. But it is compulsory you have to deliver the message. Deliver the truth. If he does not accept it, then say that no compulsion religion. Truth stands out here from you. But before you speak, you only know two words of the Quran. Lakum dinu kum and la Finish. That gives us a blank check that we should not do that. Finish. We have done the job. The Quran gives us permission that we have to sit and just relax. And people say that see, religion is a personal faith. It's a personal belief. It is something to do with an individual. You should not interfere in somebody else's private belief. It's a personal thing. Therefore, we should stick to our religion. You can talk about anything else but religion. 
if you hurt the person's feeling. I do agree, religion is a personal belief, I've got no objection to that. But let me give you an example. Let's suppose you go somewhere on, on a hill station for an outing with your family. You have your wife and her children along with you. And one of your child is a small child of hardly three years old, your son. And when you go on a hill station for an outing, while you're talking with your wife, your small son of three years old, he runs far away, which you are unaware about. By the time you realize that he has gone far away from you, you see that he has reached the end of the cliff. Even if you shout, your voice can't reach him. You can only see him as a minute dot from there. And you see that he is very close to the cliff. He is walking closer and closer to the cliff. Even if you shout, your voice won't reach him. There you see that close to your son is an elderly gentleman, a very good pious gentleman who is standing. And your son is, while walking and running, he comes closer to the cliff, to the end of the cliff. And he's very close to the elderly gentleman. The elderly gentleman sees him, but he minds his own business. And your son, he falls over the cliff. When you can see this from far away, the moment you approach that old man, won't you blame him? Won't you? You say that the elderly gentleman, he had knowledge. He had some intelligence. Couldn't he have stopped my small son from falling over the cliff? Only thing he had to do was to stretch his hand. He did not even have to take a step forward. He was so close to that young son of mine. Only thing he had to do was stretch his hand and my son would have been saved. Believe me, that elderly gentleman didn't push your son. He didn't ask your son to jump. But still, won't you blame him? You will say that he was an elderly gentleman. He could have easily stopped my son. Why didn't he do it? My son is a masoom child. What does he know? He is ignorant. Won't you blame him? No, he is behaving like us, like a Muslim. He says, it's my personal belief. Why should I interfere with somebody else's son's life? See, what difference does it make to me when he's dying? If he jumps, I'm minding my own business. Let him mind his business. In the same way, when we can see these non-Muslims, we can see that they're going to the ditch, they're going to Jahannam. What are we doing? Nothing. We are behaving like that elderly gentleman. We are minding our own business. We are minding our own business. We aren't making any effort to see to it that the people around us are prevented from entering the hellfire. Suppose your neighbor happens to be a non-Muslim and if you do not deliver the message to him on the day of judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ask your neighbor that did you get the message of Islam? He said, no Allah I didn't get the message. So Allah says, Allah will tell him that it was a duty to see to it that you obtain the truth. Because if you didn't obtain the truth, you have to go to hell. Allah will ask you that did you deliver the message to your non-Muslim neighbor and if you say no, you will follow him. You will follow him. It's compulsory that you should do da'wah. It's a duty of every Muslim. And Allah gives us the criteria for entering Jannah. Allah gives the criteria for entering Jannah in Surah Al-Asr, in chapter number 103, verse number 103. It says, Wal as al Which means, that by the token of time, man is verily in a state of loss. Allah is taking an oath in the Holy Quran. By the token of time, it is one of the biggest oaths that Allah takes in the Holy Quran. Sometimes Allah takes the oath of the fig tree, of the tin, of the of the fig, of the olive, of the stars, of the moon. Allah takes various oaths. But this oath is one of the biggest oaths. He says, well, us by the token of time, 
by the fleeting time that it passed away. In the insana of your husband, that man is verily in loss. Man is in khasara. Illa ladina amun, except those who are faith. Amun salihati, those who have righteous deeds. Watawaso bil haq, those who exhort people to the truth. And watawaso bil sab, those who exhort people to patience and perseverance. Allah says, the whole of humankind is in loss except those people who have faith, who have righteous deeds, who exhort people to truth, who do dawah and islah, and those who exhort people to patience and perseverance. These are the minimum four criteria required by the Holy Quran for any human being to enter Jannah. If you have faith, you will be fasting, you may give the path, you may have righteous deeds, etc. But if you don't do dawah, you shall not enter Jannah. Allah says, minimum four criteria required. Faith, righteous deeds, dawah and isla, that's exhorting people to truth, and exhorting people to patience for sin. All four are important. If any one of this is missing, Allah says that all four criteria are required. If anyone is missing, you shall not enter Jannah. It's compulsory duty of every Muslim to do dawah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Fusilat, chapter number 41, verse number 33, that who is better in speech than a person who invites people to the way of thy Lord? Who is better in speech than the person who invites people towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? and who says that I am amongst the Muslim. It is compulsory that every Muslim should be a Thai. But it's not compulsory that he should be a full-time Thai. It's compulsory that he should at least be a part-time Thai. But the Quran also says in Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 104, that let there arise out of you a people a group of people enjoying what is good and forbidding what is wrong. That means the Holy Quran says that amongst the Muslims there should be a group of Muslims who should be full time dying. And it is the duty of the rest of the Ummah to support these dying. Dawah is compulsory for everyone. How we have full time doctors, full time engineers, full time teachers, why don't we have full time missionaries? Why don't they put and die? Why? We, we keep the leftover for Islam. You know, a free time. Those people who are rejects of society, we put them into the field of Islam. Suppose our son fails, then we say we put him to Dawah al We want to make him half in the Quran. He fails in the school, we take him out and put him in a madrasa. See, Islam requires the best of people. Why don't you put your son who has become an engineer into the field of Islam? Why not? Put the cream of the society into the work of Islam. It is the opposite. When you find that he's handicapped, he's unfit, so you say, okay, then you remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you give the left to of Islam. People say, when I become old, I will dedicate my life to Islam. How do you know how long you're going to live? How do you know? So Allah says that there should arise out of you a group of people who should be full-time dying. Part-time dying is part of on every Muslim, without which we shall never enter Jannah. But amongst you, there should be a group of people who should be full-time dying. And it's the duty of the other Ummah, the other people in the Ummah, to support these dying. That's what the Holy Quran says. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He gives a promise in the Holy Quran. Allah says in Surah Tawbah, chapter number 9, verse number 33, and in Surah Sab, chapter number 61, verse number 9, He says, Huwa alladhi aithra rasulahu bil huta, wa dinu al-haq, liyaz hira wa al-dini pulli, wa rupar al-mushikun. Allah says that Allah has sent His messengers with guidance and the religion of truth, 
so that it will prevail over all the other ways of life. Allah says, Allah has sent His Messenger with Deen al Haq, the religion of truth. Liyaz hirao al Deen al so that it will prevail over all the other ways of life. All the other ways. Any ism, whether it be communism, Judaism, Christianism, secularism, Hinduism, Islam is destined to supersede all, to master them all, to overcome them all. Kulle! Walopari al mushikun. However much the mushrik don't like it, however much the idol worshippers don't like it, Allah is giving a promise. He says this in two places. Surah Saf chapter number 61 verse number 9 and Surah Tawbah chapter number 9 verse number 33. And a similar message is mentioned the third time in Surah Fatah chapter number 48 verse number 28. Only the last verse is different. He says, Hulla ji arsir rasul wa biluda wa deen al haq liya jira wa la deen al kulli wa khaba billahi shayda. That Allah has sent this messenger with guidance and the religion of truth so that it will prevail over all the ways of life. And enough is Allah as a witness. Allah is giving the shahada that Islam will prevail over all the other ways of life. Imagine, Allah is testifying in the Holy Quran that Islam will prevail over all the other ways of life. Suppose someone tells you that here there is a business, that in this business, this business you are surely going to succeed. You are going to get minimum 700 times profit. What will you do? You see to it that every penny of your excess wealth you will invest in that business. If somebody tells you a secret, that see, if you involve in this business, I am giving you a guarantee that you will get a lot of profit. What will you do? You will invest every penny of your saving in that business. So Allah is giving, Allah is giving the witness that this religion of Islam will prevail over all the other ways of life, with or without you. The rubbish that we are, the rubbish that we are. What are we? Nothing. Allah does not require us to spread His message. Allah is giving us an opportunity to do a profit job and to earn a profit reward. Allah does not require us. With or without you, with or without me, Islam is going to prevail over all the other ways of life. Allah is giving us an opportunity to make hay while the sun is shining. If you know that this business is going to get you profit, you will invest your every penny. We say that we believe in the Quran verbally, but actually we do not believe in it. If we would have faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we would have seen to it that we put every grain, as Allah said, as I mentioned earlier, in Surah Baqarah chapter 2 verse 261, that if you sow one grain, one corn in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah will give you seven years, each year bearing hundred corn. 700 times profit, Allah is promising you. But we don't have faith. We say we believe in the Quran verbally, but practically we don't. How much, how many people of us, how much time do we give? How much energy do we give for Islam, for the propagation? How much money do we spend in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? How much? Allah is giving us a promise. Allah is giving us an opportunity to make hay while the sun is shining. Do a profit job and earn a profit reward. I would like to end my talk by giving the quotation from the Holy Quran from Surah Nahal chapter number 16, verse 125 we say, Udu ila wal ma hasna, Which means, invite all to the way of thy Lord with wisdom and beautiful preaching and argue with them and reason with them in the way that the best in the Christian. Wa akhir da'wan, alhamdulillah, Thank <clears throat> you.